continuing on the path to build the ultimate home server. Today we're going to learn about Proxmox privilege containers, passing hardware through into containers, and everyone's favorite home media application, Jellyfin. If you haven't been following along, this is a little NAS box I've been converting to run Proxmox as the ultimate home server. It's pretty compact. It's not that powerful, but that's fine because it's low power in the uh, electricity sense. And it's got an integrated Intel GPU, and we're going to use that today to do transcoding in Jellyfin. So for those of you that have never heard of Jellyfin before, it's basically an app that runs on a server and manages your media. All those Blu-rays you've ripped, TV shows, music, etc. Unless you stream it to clients around your house, it's completely locally managed. No cloud services required and no subscriptions. You just have to provide the media yourself, usually by ripping DVDs or Blu-rays. And while that's great, one disadvantage to that is that you have to now manage all the different formats that all the different devices could potentially support. So if you're playing back a video on, say, an iPad, it's probably going to be able to play just about anything. But if you've got some old Smart TV or Raspberry Pi, it might be a little bit pickier about what it'll accept. And so that's where transcoding comes in. The server can take a graphics card like this little one I got here, or the integrated one built into my NAS, and it can use that to decode the file and then re-encode it in a format that the client can support. And that's why hardware pass-through is so important for Jellyfin, so we can get the fancy, fancy hardware acceleration to our transcoding jobs. And that's really the whole reason I'm making this video, because Jellyfin on its own is pretty easy to install by itself, but when you want to get into hardware transcode support, that's where it starts getting a little bit tricky. So to demo today, I got two different graphics cards here. This has an Intel Celeron processor with Intel integrated graphics. So this will show us how to use Intel Quick Sync. I also have this little guy here. It's a Radeon Pro WS3100, and I bought it because it was pretty cheap. Single slot, half height, which fits in my micro server here, because that's the biggest it'll fit. It's also not that expensive. It's not a great graphics card, but it'll do transcode just fine. And this will use AMD's AMD GPU driver and VA API on Linux. I unfortunately don't have an NVIDIA card I can test with. None of them fit in my servers, and I actually don't even own any. I'd have to borrow one. So no NVIDIA cards today, but I can do AMD and Intel QuickSync, and that should be a lot of your applications, especially if you're using an integrated GPU on either a Ryzen chip or an Intel chip. So with all that said, let's jump into the tutorial. So time to create a container for Jellyfin. So you can see I've already got my home assistant server and my file server. It's a quick rehash last episode. We need to download a container template. So we need to pick a storage here that can do file IO and has CT templates as one of the allowed things. Local storage allows that by default. And we need to download Debian 11. So you can click on templates here, sort by package and get Debian 11. I've already done that though in the past episode. So this is our Debian container template. I like to use containers whenever possible because they're so lightweight and there's so little overhead. So we're going to use one of them for Jellyfin again. Oh, jellies. That's how, you, that's how you do it, right? So because we're going to give Jellyfin hardware access to do transcoding, I'm going to uncheck the unprivileged container box. And like I said in the last episode, it's kind of a backwards checkbox. So when you check it, it removes privileges from the container. When you uncheck it, it gives privileges to the container. So we're going to uncheck it. And that means that the container will have root access to the system, sort of. It's still stuck within its own file system namespace, but it has access to hardware into the kernel that it wouldn't have as an unprivileged container. And that'll let us do hardware transcoding pretty easily. So we're gonna give it a password as usual. We need to pick a template. And I again have that Debian 11 standard template. Uh, we again need a disk. This disk is just going to be for the operating system template again, so 16 gigs or 10 gigs or whatever. That's fine. I'm going to give it two CPU cores, because I only have two in the system. You can give it as many as you want. And 512 megs. I'm going to bump this up to 1024, because we're doing transcoding. We might need a little bit more RAM for FFmpeg. Network, we got to give some IPs. Okay, so I typed in some IPs for my container. We're going to give it E0, bridge to BMBR0, no VLAN tags, the usual stuff, DNS host, and confirm. Let's go ahead and start it up. So just like that, we have a functioning Linux system in the container. 
So Jellyfin has a pretty good guide on how to install. So we're going to apt install xrepo. We don't need to use sudo because we're already running as root. And they have a system for managing their repository using xrepo. So we just installed xrepo. Now we use xrepo enable Jellyfin. That'll add the package repository for Jellyfin. And once we've done that, we can just do apt update and apt install Jellyfin. You can add dash y if you don't want to hit yes. It just forces it to say yes. So once that's done, we should be able to log in. So we need to go to the IP address of the container, colon 8096. Fun fact, Jellyfin has IPv6 disabled by default. I have no idea why they would do that. So you have to go to the IPv4 address. How primitive. Um, I'm not even going to bother adding a password. And I'm not going to add a media library yet. I'll come back and do that later. So we'll log in with our new user, Jellyfin, with no password. I mean, obviously you could create a username with a password if you wanted. So, where do we want to store our media now? As you know, I have two different ZFS pools on the system from the past videos, dpool and local ZFS. We can use either one of those to create a subvolume for this. However, I want to create a subvolume that I can also share with Samba in addition to using it in Jellyfin. So we're going to do this manually through the command line. So in the last episode, I told you that it's pretty easy to add a new mount point here, and it is, but the disadvantage of doing it this way is when we manage the mount points with Proxmox, we can't share them between multiple containers. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to go to the Proxmox node and go to the shell, and we'll do a ZFS list, and that'll show us everything on the ZFS system. So dpool and rpool are our two ZFS pools. So you can see we have our VM100 disks, we have our fast disk, spinning rust disk, these are all here, but they're managed by Proxmox, so we don't need to touch them. But we can create a new data set in ZFS if we'd like, and use it for whatever we want. So ZFS create our pool slash media. Actually, I'm going to put it on dpool instead. So ZFS create dpool slash media. That will give us a data set off of the dpool pool, which is our spinning hard drive pool, called media. Pretty simple. So if you ZFS list it, we see we have it there. Say we want to give it a cap so that we can't go above some size. In this case, I have two terabytes on my pool. So say we can use 1T. So ZFS set quota equals 1 equals 1T dpool slash media. Now if I do a ZFS list again, you can see that available is 1024 gigs because we've quoted it to be no more than one terabyte. So it'll show up as having one terabyte of free space. So now let's mount this new directory we created, this new data set in ZFS, dpool media. Let's mount it to both our file server container and our Jellyfin container. And back on the file server, you'll recall we have mount point zero and mount point one. And then over here, we don't have any mount points. We just have the root disk. So it's important because we need to keep aware of those mount point numbers because they come in for Proxmox. So another thing to be aware of here is the mount point. This is where the files are located on the local system. So in this case, it's dpool slash media, and they're mounted there. So that's the path we need on the local system, and the path on the remote system, or the container, we're going to put in slash mount. So the command we're going to use is pct, is proxmox container toolkit, set, and then the ID of the container, so, 10, so 402 is my jelly container, and then dash dash the mount point number, so we're say mp2, and then the path on the local system, so slash dpool slash media, comma, mp equals, and then the mount point on the remote system. So slash mount slash media. There we go. And you'll notice I picked mount point two here. And I picked mount point two because we don't have a mount point two in our file server yet. So I can come over here with the same command and mount it into 401, the file server. So then both of these guys should have a mount point two. Like over here, the file server, we have a mount point two, dpool media into mount media. And if I go to Jellyfin, we again have that same thing, dpool media into mount media. And of course, we can come back to our file server container from the last episode. And add a share to it. Another thing to be aware of is by default, this new data set is owned by root and nobody has access. So in order to give access to everyone, I'm going to chmod that new folder. So chmod dash big R for recursive 777 
Beepool Media. So now everyone has permissions to read and write to it, which is good, so our containers can operate on it, and so can our file sharing. So we have this new folder now. And here, I'm going to create a folder called Movies. Create a folder called Movies, create one called TV Shows. And I'm going to copy some stuff into these folders for my own collection for testing. So now that I've copied an assortment of stuff into that folder by a file sharing, it should show up in Jellyfin, which means we should be able to create some libraries. So libraries in Jellyfin are basically folders that have a certain type of media in them. So in this case, I made two folders, one for movies, one for TV shows. So I can click movies, um, folders. So mount media, movies. And if you'd like here, you can put the network path so that clients can connect directly to it instead of going through the Jellyfin server. I'm going to leave this out for the purpose of this video. Okay, and we'll add one more. Shows plus folders, mount media, TV shows. There we go. So then we'll scan the libraries. See what we can find. So everything is working great now. I can connect to Jellyfin in web browser using the app, etc. That works. Now the challenge is transcoding, which I'm sure is why you clicked on this video. So I go over here into the admin dashboard. So I click here, little guy dashboard. It shows me everyone who's connected now. So this is me, I'm blue. And here's another web browser that's playing back a movie. So I click on the info here. It says it's transcoding it because the video codec is not supported by the client. So if the client doesn't support whatever format the video's in, Jellyfin will decode it and re-encode it in some other version. So let's see what that does to our CPU. Ooh, yeah, our CPU is not happy right now. So it's, uh, we're putting a lot of load on our little two-core CPU. This is the entire system, too. How, how much of this is coming from our container? God, yeah, so we're, we're, we're pegging our CPU at 90% just to do this transcode. And that leaves us with about 10% for everything else going on in the system, which is not good. We're not doing too bad on RAM, though. We're using about half a gig, so it's good that I gave it a whole gig. So how do we improve this? Well, we need to give Jellyfin some hardware that can do the transcoding work for it. And thankfully, graphics cards are really good at this. There's really two steps here. There's decoding the video, which is relatively straightforward, but could be relatively computationally intensive. And then we have re-encoding the video, where we take the raw frames and compress them back down in some other format to send out. And both of these steps can potentially be accelerated by the graphics card, but the encode step is particularly important because that's harder on the CPU than the decode step. So Jellyfin has a really long page on hardware acceleration, and I will say right off the bat, this is very specific to your hardware. I don't have every piece of hardware to test, and I can't necessarily demonstrate all the different configurations, but I will try two different configurations and show you what worked for me. So we have Terra, which is the one we've been using today. This has an Intel uh, CPU with onboard graphics, so we can use the onboard graphics card with Intel QuickSync. And then I have Big Store, and Big Store has access to that Radeon WS3100. So the first thing I noticed is that the Intel, it has this note about Intel Gen 9 and newer iGPUs. And I happen to have one of those. So I have a Jasper Lake CPU. So low power encoding must be enabled. For my case, I'm already using kernel 5.15 and newer. So I'm on 6.1, which is the latest Proxmox experimental build. And they also note that we need to enable the huck or the guck. So these are basically little microcontrollers that are part of the GPU and the code for them is not available. It's a binary blob. So Linux doesn't load it by default, um, but it's not that hard to enable it. So we have to do this on the host because the host is what actually loves the driver. So we're going to come in here, go to the shell. So we're going to edit a file called etsy modprobe.d i915.com, and it should be a new file. So we're going to add some options for the i915 driver, which is the Intel integrated graphics driver. And we're going to say options, i915, enable, underscore, gut, equals three. Sort of a magic thing, but basically there's two different binary flags. So one plus two, two flags, gives us a three that tells it what microcode it should load. And I have found the latest Proxmox versions already include the microcode and everything, so we don't need to do anything other than enable it, say yes, and reboot. So Jellyfin actually has a guide for us on how to set this up on Proxmox. And it's pretty simple. We just need to copy and paste these lines here, so click the little copy button, 
into our config file. So we come over here, go to the shell, let's see PVE, let's see, 402.conf, and we'll paste it in. Obviously, you would use whatever container ID you have, minus 402. So basically what this does is it bind mounts two devices into the file system. Dev DRI card zero and dev DRI render D128. So these are the nodes from the kernel direct rendering manager, or kernel DRM. So every graphics driver on Linux will always have a dev DRI card device. And that's what's normally used by X windows and things like that. And it will probably also have a render device. And this is used by software that just wants to do rendering that doesn't need to do screen access. And then we're also giving some permissions to access these devices and we're passing through these group IDs. So we'll save that. So in order to have access to these things, we just added the config file. We need to reboot the container. So we're gonna click shut down. I'll shut it down and restart it. So let's see if we have those. There we go. Dev DRI card zero and render D128. The one thing to note now is that our dev DRI nodes are owned by root and have the group video and input. So we need to let the user Jellyfin that runs the Jellyfin account have access to these two devices. So we're going to do user mod little a dash little a dash big G, then the name of the group, so video, and the name of the user, so Jellyfin. And then we'll do the same for the group input. And that way, Jellyfin, as its user Jellyfin, should have access to card zero and render D128 because it is part of those groups. Next thing we need to do is install some Mesa drivers. And I found the easiest way to do this is to install the utility VA info. That should install the Intel libVA drivers, which we need. So for the permission changes we did to take effect, we have to restart Jellyfin. So go ahead and do that. System control restart Jellyfin. So now from our Jellyfin system, we can come over here to our user, go to admin dashboard, playback, and we have the option for transcode. So because we have an Intel GPU in this example, we're going to pick Intel Quick Sync, and we can enable decoding for all these, etc. And in my case, I happen to know that all of these except AV1 should be supported by this GPU. And because I'm on a Jasper Lake, I have to enable the low power encoder, and I can encode an H.265, which is HEVC. Depending on your hardware, you might have to enable this or you might have to disable it. You might have to try it both ways. Like it says here, the i915 HUC firmware needs to be configured, which we already did. Do the bottom and say save. And let's see if that works. So now I opened up that same movie again. And you can see if we click on the info, it's being transcoded and it says video codec is not supported. But if I go over here, our CPU usage is much lower, we're only using 11%. And if we come here to logs, we can see what it's doing. So there'll be an FFmpeg transcode log. And we'll have a whole bunch of stuff in it. So in this case, what it says it's doing is it's taking MPEG4 native into H.264, and it's using H.264 QSV, which is quick sync video. And for audio, it's doing native into AAC. So it's transcoding audio on the CPU, which is fine. It's decoding MPEG4, on the CPU, which is where our 11% CPU comes from, and then it's encoding it into H.264 using Intel QuickSync. And plenty of stuff is going on here, and the playback works fine. So I speed ran setting up Jellyfin again on my server with the AMD graphics card, and we're again going to enter the config file now. Oops. There we go. Now, one quirk on this system. If you have more than one graphics card, they may not be render D128 and card zero. So in my case, I have a basic, basic graphics card that's the IPMI, and that is card zero. So my AMD card is still render D128, but now it's card one. I'm gonna pass it through as card zero, render D128. So again, in the container, we have our card zero, which is actually card one in the host, and render D128, which in this case actually render D128 in the host too. We'd really like to keep those names identical because a lot of software will automatically look for render D128 if you don't specify. And so now we're going to do the same group ad that we did before. So in Jellyfin, this time for AMD, we're going to say VA API. And again, we need that path dev DRI render D128, which in this case it is. If we actually run VA info in the container, it'll show us 
what it supports. So it looks like we have H.264 and HEVC and VC1. Hardware decode H.264, HEVC, VC1, and MPEG-2. A little bit less features than our Intel. Um, hardware encoding options, again, we do not use the Intel Low Power Encoder because this is an AMD card. I'm not going to allow encoding in HEVC format. That wouldn't help a whole lot anyway because not a lot of clients support HEVC. We'll go down to the bottom and save this. Got it. So I got another client again playing back. If we look at their info, they're doing transcode. And if we look at the logs, we see we're transcoding f of MPEG. So we're using MPEG-4 input again. So we're decoding on the CPU. We're encoding H.264 with VA API, which is the AMD API. And we're encoding audio on the CPU. So how is our resource usage going on here? 33%, not bad. It was using about 90% with hardware encoding. So like with the other system, it makes a big difference to have hardware transcode here. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this and you were able to get this to work on your system. I got plenty of more tutorials coming for the Ultimate Home Server project, so stay tuned for more. If you want to see some others in this playlist, I've done Home Assistant and I've done Samba file sharing already. There's a playlist down in the description below of all the past episodes of this project. Don't forget to subscribe so you can see more. If you want to buy any of these things, um, feel free, I guess. Uh, they work, I guess. They're pretty cheap. Um, if you have any ideas for future projects, I always love hearing about them. I have a Discord server down in the description. Feel free to message me there. I always love hearing from viewers. And as always, I will see you on the next adventure.